I'm going to start by asking all of you a question. How many of you think that we have more illegal immigrants flooding into the United States today than we have at any time in the recent past? Just raise your hands. How many people think that? Well, a fair number of you do. Well, uh, that's the first misconception I'm going to try to set straight. We are actually at a relatively low period of illegal immigration into the United States. We reached the high point in around 2000. The worst period was between 1995 and 2000. And at that point, we had about 1.6 million illegal immigrants coming into the United States, crossing our borders, most, mostly from our southern borders, but some coming on boats from China and other places. Um, and that was the height of our illegal immigration uh, problem. Since that period, and really since the recession, because that has been uh, responsible for a lot of the slowdown, we are down to about 400,000 people coming in uh, or trying to come in illegally each year. And that, by the way, is a record that we have not seen since the 1970s. So we are actually at a decades-long low period right now in illegal immigration. Now that's not to say there aren't a whole lot of illegal immigrants living among us. There are about 11 million currently living in the United States. Again, though, we've seen that number decline from its height of 12.2 million. So there are about a million fewer illegal immigrants today than there were just a few years ago. Why has that happened? Well, first and foremost, uh, I think the fact that we have paid a lot more attention to border security has been very important in stopping that flow. We do have a partial fence uh, in the areas that get the most traffic uh, along our southern border. We have a lot of high-tech developments. We have uh, tripled the number of Border Patrol agents uh, that we had uh, at the beginning of this uh, immigration, large immigration flow uh, in the 1990s. And we now spend more on border enforcement than we do on all other federal criminal law enforcement combined. We spend more on enforcing that border than we do on the DEA, the Secret Service, the FBI, the uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Those budgets combined uh, in the criminal law enforcement area do not equal what we spend uh, enforcing our borders. So that's part of the reason we've seen that decline. The other reason is that the economy is not producing the kinds of jobs that immigrants come to take, uh, particularly immigrants at the low skilled end. We've seen a tremendous drop off in the construction industry, and that industry, uh, in fact, uh, was uh, the workplace for a vast number of illegal immigrants. Not in the high-skilled jobs, uh, usually as laborers, as drywall hangers, as painters, etc. So that's one of the big misconceptions that I think we have to talk about. There are other misconceptions. A lot of people say, well, illegal immigrants come here to go on welfare and to commit crimes. Well, that turns out not to be true either. Uh, there have been a number of studies uh, done that look at the likelihood of uh, a, a foreign-born male committing a crime compared to others. And in the Mexican-born population, the crime rate for both violent and uh, property crimes is actually lower among those who are foreign-born, who are immigrants, than it is among the native population. It is considerably lower, it's a fraction of uh, the criminal rates uh, in the black community. Uh, and it is roughly what uh, the criminal rates for that uh, group uh, of young men is among whites. So that is a misconception. And when you look at the data on where immigrants live, it turns out, and again, there have been some studies on this, that if you're poor and don't have a lot of you know, choices about where you're going to live and you can't afford high rents, Pick an immigrant neighborhood because the crime rate is going to be lower there. You're statistically less likely to become a victim of crime uh, in one of those neighborhoods than you are uh, in uh, a neighborhood of similar socioeconomic status among the native born. And finally, I would say just looking at the safest big cities in America to live, for several years running, the safest big city in America to live 
is 10 miles, not even 10 miles, not even 10 minutes, from one of the most dangerous places in our hemisphere. And that place is El Paso, Texas. And of course, I'm talking about war as Mexico as being one of the most dangerous places in America, or in the uh, Western Hemisphere. And yet, El Paso, Texas is home to a population of Hispanics, which is in the 80, 85% uh, area. And among those Hispanics who live in El Paso, a uh, huge number are in fact foreign born, and a very large number are there illegally. So I want to push that aside. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about illegal immigration. I would not say that. I think we are a sovereign nation, and we have the right to determine who comes and who doesn't come to America. And even though our you know, Bible tells us that we must be welcoming of the foreigner, that we must treat strangers with compassion, uh, beyond that, though, we do have a right to say, well, there are a whole lot of people in the world who want to come here, and we have to have priorities. We have to admit people who we're admitting not just on a compassionate basis, but who are going to have a chance of making it in America, who are going to uh, assume our uh, values, and uh, who are going to accept the responsibilities of what it means to live in a civil society. But the fact is that uh, the immigrants uh, who come here uh, do exhibit those factors. And the question is, how do we go about dealing with the illegal immigration problem in a way that's most effective? Now, you already heard Jeff quote his, um, the, the top uh, vote-getting candidate so far in, in the Republican Party. I'm praying a novena to St. Jude, the, the patron saint of hopeless causes, uh, that that will not be true after tomorrow, but you know, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, but you've already heard that he said that the best way to do it is to build a wall. And of course, we're going to get Mexico to pay for it. Yeah, that's going to happen. Uh, but uh, it turns out that may not be the most effective way. And because it isn't going to be Mexico that's going to pay for it, it's going to be you and me that are going to pay for it if it gets built. Uh, let's look at other ways of trying to control this flow. And my view is, and it's borne out by history and borne out by everything we know about why it is that immigrants come to the United States, both legally and illegally, is that we need to reform our legal immigration system. In the 1940s and early 1950s, we had a huge illegal immigrant population. We had 1.2 million people coming in every year illegally at the height uh, of that period. Now that's at a time when we had a population that's half the size it is now. So that would be equivalent to about two and a half million people crossing in illegally uh, into the United States to do work mostly in the fields uh, of the Southwest in our agricultural fields. Uh, and you know there were a lot of problems. What are we going to do about this? Um, it was uh, it was considered a crisis. Well, one of the things that we did that was the most effective was not the program which had the terrible name during the Eisenhower administration, Operation Wetback, which in fact forcibly uh, deported and repatriated uh, people here illegally. That isn't what stopped the problem. What stopped the problem is an acting, a guest worker program, which reduced illegal immigration in that period by more than 90%. We went from 1.2 million to about 40,000 people trying to get into the country illegally. Huge drop. So what should we be doing today in terms of our legal immigration system? Well, first and foremost, we have to look at the current system we have. And it is absolutely true that we are the most generous nation in the world in terms of bringing people into this country. We are an immigrant nation. Uh, most of the people up here, I would assume, either like Hugo, are immigrants themselves, uh, or are people who have ancestors who were. I will tell you, in my own background, uh, I do have an immigrant background. It goes back to the 1840s, and the immigrants in my family came from Ireland. And I'm sure that'll all surprise all of you with the name like Chavez. Uh, the Chavezes and the Armijos, which are the two families I uh, descended from in New Mexico, 
came in 1601 and 1701, respectively, uh, and they came as colonists, uh, as conquerors, uh, not, uh, not as immigrants. So, uh, but most of us have immigrant groups in this country. And even though we like to think of ourselves as a great immigrant nation, we've always had mixed feelings about immigrants. In the 19th century, we were worried about the Germans who were coming. In the middle of the 19th century, we had about 5 million Germans who came uh, to the United States. And by the way, many of them came here to Colorado. Colorado still, uh, I think Colorado's biggest ethnic population by ancestry is still German. It's not, uh, it's not Hispanic. So we had a lot of people coming here, but people who were already here were worried about it. They thought, well, they're never going to learn English. And in fact, here in Colorado, we had bilingual schools, and they weren't <laughs> Spanish bilingual schools. They were German bilingual schools. We taught German immigrant kids in German in the public schools here in Colorado. We did it in Nebraska. We did it in several other Wisconsin, lots of other places throughout the country. Then um, we had uh, another flow of people coming from Ireland when my ancestors came. Uh, they already spoke English, so that wasn't a problem. But there was tremendous animosity towards them uh, because of their religion. Many of them were Catholic, and they were settling in largely Protestant areas. Then, of course, uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, we had Chinese coming in as laborers. They were brought in. Uh, much as we see today with uh, Mexican and Central American labor, coming in as low-skilled workers, helping build, build the railroads and do other things. And there was a terrible backlash. And in fact, the backlash was so strong, we passed laws, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, and later that was expanded to all Asian groups, uh, and we shut the door. Then at the beginning of the 20th century, we had people coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, the Italians, the Poles, the Greeks, uh, the uh, uh, people from uh, other places, uh, Czech, you know, what is now the Czech Republic, uh, and other countries uh, in that region. Uh, and again, there was a big backlash. The Germans, who by then had learned English and considered themselves fully American, were very, very suspicious about these Italians and these Poles that were coming in. They were never going to learn English. They were never going to be good Americans. And there was a terrible backlash. And so at that point, we passed the first uh, legislation, national legislation, to restrict immigration. We basically shut the golden door. And we said, we're going to have a quota. You can't come here unless you had ancestors here before this flow of people from Southern and Eastern Europe, which meant that Northern Europeans would continue to be able to come. And by the way, it also meant Mexicans would be able to come because they had roots here. Uh, but it shut the door to uh, many of the people in the early 20th century uh, who were coming. And now we have a system in which instead of looking at America's economic needs, our social needs, needs and other factors, we have a system that is based almost entirely on family reunification. We say that if you've got a close relative here, you can sponsor somebody to come to the United States. And we, we uh, bring in about 500,000 uh, people that way uh, who are given permanent residency based on their relationship with a relative. We only have about 140,000 people that are able to get in based on their skills. And this is what I would do if I were going to change our immigration system. I would recognize that the United States does a terrific job educating Americans to do the great vast majority of jobs, the jobs sort of in the, in the middle ranges. And yet, we do a rather poor job of educating people at some of the high-tech fields, the STEM workers, the science, technical, engineering, mathematics work. Uh, workers. Uh, if you go to the engineering schools in many of our state schools around the country and you look at who's studying there, many of them are foreign born. And we do this crazy thing where we spend, you know, so much of our taxpayer money educating these people. They graduate and then we say, adios, you know, see you later, goodbye. You can't stay here and work. You've got to go back to your own country. So one of the things I would do would be to open up our immigration system to change it, to make it one that's based on skills. And we need people at that high end. But we also need people at the low end. Because frankly, I doubt that there are very many of you out there who want your children to grow up and aspire to be 
uh, deboners at the poultry processing plants in Greeley, Colorado, or to pick peaches on the western slope of Colorado, or tomatoes in California, uh, or frankly, to clean the toilets uh, in the downtown buildings of uh, Denver. Uh, we spend a lot of money on education, and most Americans have more than a high school education. Uh, so why not have some of those jobs go to people for whom it is a step up in terms of their economic um, aspiration? Uh, it's a steady job that pays wages well beyond what they would be able to earn in their homeland. And the fact is that their children won't be doing those jobs. Their children will be American, and their children will, in fact, be graduating high school. In fact, they're now graduating high school Hispanic. Uh, second generation Americans are graduating high school at essentially the same rates as non-Hispanic whites. There's about a 2% differential. And they're actually now, recently, more likely to go on uh, to pursue higher education, although many of them are going to two-year as opposed to four-year colleges. So I think we could fix this problem tomorrow by doing two things. Enacting legal immigration reform that's based on skills. Uh, we ought to be able to give preference to people who know English, uh, because even if you're sitting in a village in Guatemala, it's possible through the internet and other means to learn English, and it is going to be easier for you to survive here if you do. So we can have other requirements in there. Uh, certainly we want to vet people, we want to make sure uh, that they are not criminals, uh, that they're not potential terrorists, as Jeff suggested. But if we do that, and we enact a guest worker program to bring people in for temporary jobs, uh, I think we could solve our illegal immigration uh, problem overnight. We've done it before, I think we can do it again. And I think we will be a more secure, economically uh, successful nation if we do that. But we ought to do it in a way that is not only skills-based, but focuses on the market. When we have downturns, we don't want to bring a whole lot of people in. Uh, when we're booming, uh, we may need more workers. I think that's the best approach. And unfortunately, it's an approach that I don't hear any candidate on either side of the political aisle talking very much about these days. Thank you.